Good evening. Welcome to the Gazelle School of Business webinar on hiring your first office assistant. This is one of many free webinars we're offering to the piano service industry. Now, I'll cover every topic you can imagine related to building and running a piano service business. Luke will be monitoring the chat and the Q&A, so ask your questions there, and we'll try to answer as many as we can at the end. All right, let's dive right in. Start to finish, the application time for this webinar is probably only about 40 hours spread over three months. It'll take an hour or so to go through the checklist, and we'll be providing you to help you decide if you're ready to hire. And then another 39 hours of actual work spread over the next three months to get ready for your new employee. Today, I'm here with Timothy Barnes. He's a registered piano technician and the co-founder of Gazelle. Hey, George. You know, all small business owners are going to eventually have a problem. Your time will become too valuable to waste on non-revenue producing things like bookkeeping, email, returning phone calls, and things like that. Success as a business means that you are going to start to feel the pressure of managing a growing business. And so one day you're going to find yourself asking, am I at this point? Right? Am I actually ready to hire an office assistant? You will know that you've reached a tipping point when your evenings and weekends are all of a sudden filled with office work, replying to emails and bookkeeping. So you wake up one day and say, aha, I have the perfect win-win situation here. Uh, I'm gonna hire an office assistant and they will pay for themselves. I will be free of the office work and my income will go up because I've dedicated more and more of my time to turning billable hours. Uh, but the truth is this kind of thinking is a disaster waiting to happen. And if this is all you're thinking, then the worst thing you can do right now is hire somebody. But you have a dilemma because the second worst thing is to do nothing. At best, you'll hire the wrong person, pay them the wrong amount, and waste time cleaning up the mess. At worst, you're gonna spend the next five years alone being stressed out and losing money. Now, the thing you have to realize is this, right? You are solving a time problem. You don't have enough time. Your time is too valuable to waste. You know you can make more money if you can turn more billable hours, but you think that hiring someone now will cause all this to happen. But here's the problem that nobody talks about. You don't solve a time problem with a bad solution that ends up costing you even more time. And this is where most people get it wrong. Hiring an office assistant doesn't save time or money unless it is done right. And most people don't do it right. They make rookie mistakes at every step of the way. So, okay, I'm gonna put $35,000 cash on the table. What would you do with it? Now you're looking at $35,000 cash right there in front of you, sitting on the table. Would you give it to the next person you see? The first person you interview? Perhaps you would pocket it as extra compensation for dealing with all the overtime and stress you currently are dealing with. Or maybe you would hire only a part-time person for $20,000 and put the remaining $15,000 in your pocket. Now this gets real when you think about it this way. Because it's just wrong to waste this much money on a rookie mistake. I mean, in two of those scenarios I just listed, you either trade the entire $35,000 for somebody else's time, or you negotiated a better deal and kept $15,000 cash in your pocket. Now. If you make a rookie mistake here, it's gonna cost you dearly. But you don't have to make a rookie mistake if you hire the right person. Set everybody up for success and install guardrails for your business. So you don't accidentally wake up one day and realize you've driven yourself into a ditch. And this is where the grass isn't always greener on the other side of the fence. You know, sometimes it's just brown, crusty, dead, because somebody jumped the gun. And you don't know this from the outside, but they're having a hard time meeting payroll every two weeks. So just because they have an assistant doesn't mean it's all roses. As a business owner, they feel stuck 
because they want to make it work with their employee, but they really need to let that person go. And that's not a fun scenario. So we're going to help you navigate the pitfalls so you don't have to have these rookie mistakes. Now, Luke is going to be posting a downloadable guide into the chat channel to give you a checklist to walk through the first time you hire an employee. And hiring the right person is critical. If you hire the wrong person, it's going to cost you money on day one. And it'll keep costing you time and money until you fire them. So you need to ask a critical question. What problem are you trying to solve? There's, there's a ton of them that you could be going for, right? I just don't like doing X. Um, I'm spending evenings doing Y. Uh, my spouse can't help with my office work anymore. I've had a life change. I have more calls than I can return. Um, I know my business can grow, but I don't have enough time to get a handle on it. There's lots of reasons and lots of problems that you're trying to solve. But if you don't know the problem you're trying to solve, you're guaranteed to hire the wrong person. So how do you know if you are ready to hire an office assistant? Well, there are a handful of cues that will indicate you are ready to hire somebody now. Number one, can you articulate the problem you're trying to solve? And what George just talked about a moment ago is absolutely critical. But the truth is, I couldn't articulate this problem the first time I hired an office assistant. And I look back now and I think, what was I thinking? Uh, but if you aren't able to articulate your problem, then here's what you're going to do. Over the next 10 days, or whenever you're ready, just pick any 10-day period, you are going to pay close attention to the tasks that you're doing in your business, right? Make a log to record what you do, how much time it takes, and make a note when you think that this is something you'd rather have somebody else do. Yeah, and if you find that you only need someone at the end of the month, you might need a bookkeeper, not an office assistant, right? And that's the power of knowing the problem you're trying to solve. But if at the end of 10 days, you find that you feel stressed looking at everything on your list, then you probably definitely need an office assistant. So the second is, do you have money to spare? Now, meaning you're profitable and you can cover the added costs of hiring someone now. And we have two past webinars you can watch that guide you through getting profitable and pricing your services. So, but for now, remember this, there is more to consider than just the cost of their salary. So consider their wages, right? Salary for a full-time person, total earnings if this is a part-time or hourly position. And don't forget about employee benefits. Benefits are an added cost on top of their wages, whether this is an hourly employee or a salaried position. You also need to add in the cost of a, a one-time training fee period that you're gonna pay to yourself from your business for sourcing and training your new recruit. You're gonna to have to spend time answering questions, providing direction, communicating expectations, periodically inspecting their work. In short, managing your staff. You have to be sure to include a monthly management fee for your time spent helping them succeed. You're taking on a new job. And payroll taxes. As an employer, you or your accountant are gonna be responsible for filing out some extra paperwork each month and possibly even paying into your regional government's unemployment insurance program. And that all together is gonna to be how you calculate the total cost of adding this position to your business. So just for fun, let's pretend you decide to hire a full-time office assistant for a salary of $25,000 a year, or roughly $12 an hour if this is a part-time hourly wage, right? And so your benefits in this scenario are going to end up costing you around $3,750 a year. Your training costs will probably be about $1,500 as a one-time fee every time your position turns over. And you can anticipate that a $12 an hour position is going to turn over like clockwork every 12 to 24 months. So this makes it really easy to calculate the average cost of training to $750 per year if, on average, the people you hire stay with you for two years. 
Next, you are going to have an estimated $4,000 in expenses to cover your time spent being a part of your managerial team managing your new employee, right? And so answering questions and providing oversight uh, is just part of the new job that you've taken on and you need to be paid for that because when you're doing this, you can't be out tuning pianos and turning more billable hours. And so we need to make sure that we consider all these things. And then add in payroll taxes and paying your accountant to file your payroll taxes each month, right? Either you're gonna pay your accountant a little more each month to file the paperwork, or you're gonna have to pay yourself to file the paperwork. And you get a grand total of $35,000 per year to, take, to pay your employee $12 per hour. Now, another way of looking at this is you have to pay 40% more than their hourly wage to cover all the other things associated with having an employee on your team. Now, this is for a full-time position. So just cut those numbers in half if you only plan to hire a part-time person, or maybe you only need somebody for five or 10 hours a week, and that's a very part-time you know, person. You know, just look at whatever the total earnings are as a function of their hourly wage and add 40%, and you're gonna be really close into the ballpark of what that position's going to cost. But either way, you absolutely need to calculate all of these things. Now, we've been, <clears throat> we've been talking about whether or not you're ready to hire and whether you have money to spare. And the truth is, you don't have the money right now. It, if, if you don't have the money right now, it doesn't mean you don't need to fill the position. It just means that you need to plan for how you're going to cover those additional costs. And that's the next cue that you're ready to hire. So how do you plan? And, and do you have a plan? And are you organized? If you're thinking about hiring this person to help you organize, that is a different problem that has a different solution. Instead of going through all the expense of hiring an office assistant, you just might find somebody to help you get organized. That's a heck of a lot cheaper. It's a very temporary gig and almost always has a better outcome than hiring somebody for one job and then expecting them to do another. If you hire an assistant expecting them to fix your organization problems, that's not going to happen. Once you're organized, you can start the process of hiring an office assistant. The next thing you need to consider is whether you have time to devote to training. And this is the question most people never think to ask. So maybe you do something counterintuitive, like hiring them during your slow season, right? This is when you have the most time to give to training and when it is the least stressful to learn this new job, right? This is a win-win for everybody. The worst thing you can do is hire someone, then have to lay them off right away. So do you have their salary saved? Because before you hire, you need to take a few months ahead of time and deposit their expected salary into a savings account. This will help you ensure your business can sustain this added expense. And if you need to raise prices, go ahead and do this now so you can start to let your clients pay for the added cost of running your growing business. So at a minimum, you're gonna need one month of salary saved. But best practice is to have three months of expenses in savings, and that includes everyone's salaries, both you and now your assistant. If you follow these steps, there is no question that you're ready to hire. So now the question is who? And how do I find them? First, uh, we're going to talk where you are going to talk to people who have done this. Now, I've personally hired about eight office assistants in the past 10 years. And so when you find these people, it actually doesn't need to be a piano technician. This could just be any freelancer, specifically a freelancer who's hired an office assistant is the type of person you want to go find. So look around people in your city that you know who run small freelance gigs and have an office assistant and just ask them things like, you know, when did you hire your first office assistant? Where did you find them? What was your revenue at the time? How much would you pay that person if you were hiring them today? How long did they stay with you, right? What kinds of benefits did you offer them? 
And so if you were to ask me these questions today, I would tell you, well, I hired my first office assistant in 2008, one week before the crash. And for the next four years, I got away with paying around $10, $12 an hour. But four years later, all of a sudden, I could not get somebody at $12 an hour because the economy had changed. I was really hiring people who couldn't find a job elsewhere. I didn't know that at the time, but it became pretty clear as I went on. And so I would actually advise you to do something really different than what I did because I made a lot of rookie mistakes. And next, you are going to need the right mindset because office assistants are temporary. My best assistant stayed with me in that role for three and a half years. My worst stayed with me for about three months. Now, we know the emotions you're going through because both of us have hired multiple people. And especially if this is the first time that you are approaching this issue, right? We have heard almost all of the horror stories of how bad things can go when you rush in and hire the wrong person. And the truth is, you're gonna be fine. Because if you go into a hiring interview with this much thought and intentionality, you're gonna find a gem and you're gonna rule out all the duds, right? So put your fears and your, your concerns aside. You are gonna be intentional and it's gonna work out. Because after all, you're gonna be thinking about that $35,000 on the table and you're gonna be asking, do I really want to pay you that much or should I pass, hold on to my hard earned money and wait for a real superstar to apply? Let's move on to step two. You need to set everyone up for success, including yourself. So let's talk about setting yourself up financially. You need to have already hired an accountant or you need to be prepared to spend around 100 hours a year doing payroll, filing IRS forms, issuing year-end tax forms to your employees. I could go on and on and on and on. If you would have told me this the day I hired my first employee, I wouldn't have believed it. But let me tell you, I figured out in year one, I screwed up. I figured out in year two, I didn't plan enough hours, right? And by year three, I was thinking, man, there's got to be a better way, right? If you need to change your pricing structure, now is the time to do this. I actually waited about three years to change my pricing structure. And I actually will never forget the day I woke up and realized I was paying my office assistant more than I was earning hourly because I hadn't factored in the true cost of the position, right? And because your overhead structure is about to change, it might not change that much, right? It might only change $4 per appointment when you look at how many hours you actually need. But if it's gonna change $4 per appointment, I kind of want you to go ahead and raise your prices five bucks so your clients are going to pay for the cost of growing your new business, not you. And so a quick rule of thumb that you can use is if you need to raise prices, raise them two times whatever their hourly wage is. So if you're planning on hiring and paying an office assistant $12 an hour, then go ahead and just raise your rates 25 bucks. And if you think you can't do this, you can. Just watch the pricing webinar that, online that you can, we did a couple of months ago, right? Go ahead and watch that. You can raise your prices $25 without losing clients. You've got this. And we, as your coach here, our biggest priority is just to make sure that your clients are going to cover the cost of hiring your office assistant, not you. So now, the next is don't expect them to be you. Your new assistant is not a carbon copy of you. They should and will do a better job at the job you've given them than you are currently doing. This is their gifting. It was never your passion, but it should be theirs. So make space for them to fix your broken systems. After all, you're hiring an assistant because you have a broken system right now. And give them a complete job description. If they are expected to do something then put that in their job description. Being clear is being kind. So list everything. I want you to return phone calls. I want you to return email. I want you to fill holes in my calendar by calling clients who are due for service. I want you to print postcards and mail them to people that are overdue for service. I want you to process invoices for me. 
I want you to do data entry and gazelle. I need you to take notes about important conversations you've had with clients, right? I need you to assist me with oddball requests that are going to come up from time to time. And when I need you to reschedule appointments because I have the flu, I, I need to be able to just call you and have you reschedule all that for me so I don't have to do it when I'm sick. Right? And I need you to pick up every phone call I have when I'm out in the field because I need help while I'm out in the road. If you put all this in the job description, it's going to be great. Now, the job description is an agreement between you and your employee. It's really about communication and expectations. And if you ask them to do something that's not in there, well, you owe them one, right? Sometimes acknowledgement is all that's needed. You know, a kind word or a thank you. But listen, if you plan to constantly ask them to work outside the job description, then you need to put $3,000 a year in your budget for chocolate and basketball tickets. Or you need to increase your new hire training budget because people are going to quit on you. And you need to simplify their success metrics. Right. A job description is different than the metric you use to measure their success. In your job as a piano technician, right, your client will not fire you if you drive up in a Hyundai or a Ford, but they will if the piano sounds horrible. Right. How you get to your client's house is not one of your success metrics. The same is true for your employee. Right. So reduce their success metric down to three very clear things. And these three things need to be so important to you that you are willing to terminate their, their employment over it if they don't meet these three things, right? So maybe your success metrics are answer all calls and return voicemail on the same day, right? If you're not answering every call or at least returning it on the same day, that's important enough to me that I need to find somebody else who can do that. Right. I need you to reply to every email within two hours. Right. I need you to call 20 overdue people a day. Right. If these are your three success metrics, there might be, you know, when I read that job description earlier, there were like 10, 15 things. But if these are the three things you're willing to terminate their employment over, you need to be super clear about that. So tell your employee, these three things are the non-negotiables. This is how I determine if I need to find somebody else, but you've got a lot of other things I need you to do as you have time. So keep it simple though, and be clear so they can succeed. All right, listen, don't give them a sales quota. They're not a sales staff. If you're relying on them to pay for their position by filling your free time with new sales, then you're not ready to hire. You see, someone new at a job doesn't need the pressure of having to meet a sales quota so they can keep their job next week, especially with an office assistant, not a salesperson. I'm going to say that again. They're, not a, they're an office assistant, not a salesperson. This is going to cause a great person to quit. And George, one of the things I did when I first hired somebody, uh, I didn't give this any thought. And I was actually a little bit surprised when one day I realized I was feeling pressure to let them go because they weren't doing something. And when I sat down, I realized, wait a minute, I want them to be a salesperson here because I have holes in my schedule to fill because I, was, I didn't actually do all the calculations ahead of time. Um, and so my business couldn't sustain it. Uh, but I never put that in their job description. And so all of a sudden, I, I never brought this up with them because as soon as I realized it wasn't in their job description, I solved it a different way. But that would have really strained the relationship. And I, it would have cost me a lot of chocolate and a lot of baseball cards if I started doing this. And so um, anyway, uh, moving on. The last thing that you need to do is you need to install guardrails. You do not have an HR department, right? You are the HR department. So do yourself a favor and set up two guardrails in your business. Number one, schedule performance review dates. The day you hire them, these are already on the calendar. Don't sit back and think, oh, I'll do that one, you know, in three months or in a year. No, you're, gonna, you're not going to do it. Just go ahead and tell them you're hired on March 31st or, or where are we? We're in uh, February, so April, May, June. On June 1st, 
uh, I'm going to do a performance review. So be clear about the success metrics, right? And check in more often early in the process. And when you put their performance reviews on the calendar, right, you don't have to call it this if you don't want to, but this is what it is. So don't be shy if you need to have a hard conversation. And yes, you need to fire them if they are not performing and meeting their success metrics. And remember your three metrics that we talked about earlier? This is where having these things be so important to you, you're willing to terminate them if necessary is critical. Because if you slip something in there that's a nice to have, it's gonna be really confusing where you're like, oh man, I feel like I need to fire you because you're not meeting the success metric, but the success metric doesn't matter. That's not gonna do you any favors. So make sure they're all really important. And Tim, throughout my professional career, I've hired a ton of people and I've probably had to fire about 10% of them. Uh, but I've also helped another 40%, right? Spread their wings and thrive somewhere else. So just for everybody, if you ever, if you need any help addressing a bad hire or a difficult situation, just email Gazelle Support and I can coach you through this. The next thing that you need to do, the next guardrail, is you need to set revenue targets, right? Building this position is going to distract you temporarily. So your numbers will go down, but hopefully not by too much. So do yourself a favor and say, I can never average less than X dollars over a three month period. Otherwise, I need to cut the position. And by X date, I need to be averaging X dollars over a three month period and Y dollars over a 12 month period. If I'm not within 5% of this number, I will cut the position because either I have the wrong person or this position isn't set up properly. So following these steps is going to create a low risk of failure for your business. You didn't hire the wrong person. You gave them a clear path to success and you reviewed their progress and you fired them if they didn't perform. And honestly, speaking of firing people, you know, nobody wants to talk about this. So what's between hiring and firing? Well, potential for your employee, for your company and for you. And everybody is gonna grow, th grow through this process. So never hire someone you are not willing to fire, right? Firing isn't bad. You're just setting them free to reach their full potential elsewhere. For some reason, they couldn't do it with you. Either you were a really bad coach, their life situation wasn't good, or they were not a good fit for your company. Now, only one of these things reflects badly on you. The other two, you have absolutely no control over. And so hiring a family member might not be the best thing if you're not willing to fire them. But it can sometimes work, and actually usually it does, because they are, you right now are essentially a family-run company. And so hiring a family member fits within the DNA of your company culture. Now, never fire someone if you haven't been clear. It just goes back to that idea of clarity and intentionality. If they do something wrong, you're going to teach them. And if they do it again and you were unclear, you're going to teach them again and you're going to remind them. But this time you're going to be super clear. And if they do it a third time, then you're going to tell them you need to review the position. And this is where the phrase dysfunctional politeness can be a real problem. To be so polite that we are unclear because we ourselves are uncomfortable, right? So be willing to be uncomfortable for the sake of your company. And this is a growing process for everybody, including you. And help them reach their full potential, right? Sometimes what is best for them isn't going to be in your company long-term, right? Imagine a situation where somebody is doing 50% of their job description really, really well, right? They are just knocking it out of the park and they are meeting all three of their success metrics. But there's also a bunch of other things that just are not going well at all. So remember, these people are not you. 
and they are not a robot. And sometimes they just need coaching. And if that doesn't solve the problem, well, then it's time to consider setting them free to reach their full potential at a different company. But this is called managing them out. And it's a way to end on good terms to say, listen, I can tell that you're not thriving here and I wanna to get to the bottom of this and I wanna help you and I'm gonna spend some time helping you, but eventually I just need to be honest and say, this isn't working, let's help you move on. And so if you're having trouble with an employee, memorize this phrase. You seem unhappy in your role. What's going on? Because I've been noticing that XYZ isn't getting done and it makes me feel like I should set you free to pursue something else. So I thought we should talk about this first. Then let them speak. If they are unhappy, they will tell you that they want to quit and then you get the opportunity to manage them out or let them walk. This is just better for everyone all around. If I were to have just barged in there and say, you're not doing X, Y, Z, I've had it, I've tried everything and now you're done, you're out of here. Now I'm just out a you know, halfway decent person for a few weeks, I'm stressed, I feel like I need to hire somebody tomorrow and I'm gonna make a bad hire on the next one too. And so you, know, you, you want to manage people out that's the preference over firing them. Uh, and it's just better this way for everyone all around. And you get to part ways on good terms. Great. Congrats. It's decision time. You already know if you're ready to hire because you followed the guide that you downloaded earlier. And if you go through our guide and check all those boxes, then you're ready to hire. Just put up a help wanted sign, follow the steps, start interviewing people. And if you are not ready, then most companies can complete those items in that checklist in the next 12 weeks. So focus on making the necessary changes and make it happen as soon as possible. We want you to succeed, right? So remember, you identified a problem in your company. Inaction is a form of failure because now it needs to be done. You have to solve that problem. So let's talk about a, a couple of tips for making that happen. With Gazelle, uh, you can hire somebody anywhere in the country, right? Family and friends, these are a great source of new employees. High schoolers and college students, right? These people have plenty of flexible time and they're really cheap, right? Stay at home parents who want a side hustle. These people tend to be highly qualified and usually more experienced and more reliable. Nextdoor.com, you can find a neighbor. Clients and networking, right? You can easily find a highly qualified and experienced person inside your tribe of clients. Just send an email out to some of your best clients and say, listen, do you know somebody? I'm looking to hire. And what about a temp agency? Well, to be honest, this is the first time you've hired. You don't need a temp agency. You can use it if you think that you're going to be helpful, but you probably don't need them. You get your first employee usually the same way you found your first clients, by word of mouth. Is distance an issue? Well, thanks to technology, distance is no longer an issue, right? Gazelle handles reminders and scheduling, but we haven't talked yet about phone calls and how you're going to manage the phone lines and things like that. Well, technology makes it really easy, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit. But, you know, we have a number of gazellers who live on either the East or the West Coast, they actually hire a part-time office assistant 3,000 miles away on the other side of the country. And these are usually friends of the family and they do a really great job. Mm -hmm. And flexibility is better than cash for some people. Remember, there's a lot of reasons beyond pay that people will want to work for you. And if you build it right, you'll have a line of people wanting this position. And when it comes to writing a job description, if you do these four things, be thorough, be specific, focus on the success metrics, and then sort the items from most important to least important, you are gonna write a killer job description. And remember, cash is still cash. Humans are always more expensive than automation. So a good stack of cash will almost always be appreciated. So you need to plan 
to pay anywhere between $12 and $27 an hour, which includes payroll taxes. And this is going to vary depending on whether this is their first job, the cost of living where that person lives, the state or province you live in, the scope of your job description, how long you want them to stay, and how experienced you want them to be. Whatever you do, consider paying them well. Remember this, that with Gazelle, you're going to need fewer people so you can afford to pay one person a little bit better and still get a bargain, right? When I, prior to Gazelle, I had a more than a one-to-one -one ratio between office staff and technicians. I needed a lot of people to run the company just to make it work. And that was actually a stress on the overhead of the company. And now with Gazelle, you know, we have one full-time person who's very full-time managing one, two, three, four, five, six, seven technicians now. And so you're able to, with one person, get a lot more done. So I pay her really well, right? And so you're going to use this to your advantage. Uh, paying somebody slightly more to lower turnover can be a successful strategy. Because remember, you're actually saving money. If I'm having to pay $1,500 every time it turns over, well, I could just give that person $1,500. But if you're gonna do this, never pay more than a 20% premium and use the Whopper test. If you drive past McDonald's or Burger King and you see that they're paying people more to flop Whoppers than you're currently paying your people, then you need to rethink your pay structure. Don't recreate the wheel. Use our checklist. There's a time to be creative and there's a time to just do what works and learn from others. And this will help you avoid 80% of all those rookie mistakes and 100% of the big ones that result in paying that steep, stupid tax. And use Gazelle, right? You want to refine your reminders to encourage self-scheduling. Let me just give you a scenario here. If all of your email reminders say, please call me, and then you are now paying somebody to sit in that seat, you're solving a scheduling problem in the most expensive way possible. So reword all your reminders to simply, please schedule online, right? Your office assistant will be way more expensive than Gazelle. And so people who choose to pay more for something that isn't necessary typically don't succeed in life. So use automation to your advantage. I'm going to go back one uh, for giving your employees the tools to succeed, right? You identified a problem in your company and you hired someone to solve it. So now you need to make sure that they have what they need to do their job. You've got automation in place, but consider a few other questions, right? Where do you think that they're going to work? Are they going to be at home, an office space, in your office, in your home? What tools do they need? An iPad, a computer, a phone headset? Um, how will you and they communicate? Do you expect phone calls, emails? What email address are they gonna use? Are they using Ring Central or Voice over IP instead of a cell phone? Do they have Gazelle? And George, another thing you can do is use things like acuity scheduling to cut down on voicemail. Earlier when I mentioned that our office assistant is very full-time, I'll never forget the day she called me and she said, Tim, I'm sorry I didn't get that thing done you asked. I literally spent eight hours on the phone today. I mean, she would just hang up and it would ring. She'd hang up and it'd ring. She'd hang up and it'd ring. And I thought, oh my goodness, thank you. It wasn't that important. But we actually had a really big problem because my cost for hiring another person was pretty steep. And there was this weird space in there where it's like, ah, it's not worth it to hire somebody yet, but you're, you're like at nine hours a day, 10 hours a day. So we set it up with Acuity Scheduling uh, because we all know that if you don't pick up the phone call, they're just going to keep calling. So I set up a scenario where our voicemail, when you called the company, it basically said, hey, hey, sorry, we're on the phone with somebody. Um, you, you can schedule a time to get a call back by going to our website and clicking here. And we found that this had two effects. Number one, people who wanted us to call them back actually went and scheduled a phone call for later that afternoon in 10-minute slots with our office assistant. She loved it. 
The other thing it did is people who were calling us because they just kind of wanted to talk to somebody but knew they could schedule online, well, they went and scheduled online. And if they still had a question, they went and booked a time for the next afternoon or the next morning to get a call back on a specific question. We still got the appointment. They didn't go somewhere else. And so acuity scheduling actually is built for that kind of scenario. And we used it to our advantage. Uh, change your voicemail. Right, this again goes the same thing with the emails. If your voicemail is not prompting people to book online, it needs to prompt people to book online. Uh, push everything to Gazelle's self-scheduler that you possibly can. Have your office assistant even recommend that people use Gazelle to schedule their next appointment. This happens with phone tags. So if she calls somebody back or he calls somebody back, just have their script be, oh, and you can book online really easy. Just you know, let us know. Right, so you want to get to the point where people, the people who call you are calling because they have some special situation that requires them to talk to a human. Um, we give our office staff paid vacation. And so I don't have two office staff at the time. So when she's on vacation, guess who's picking up the phone? It's me. And I thought, no worries. Uh, I have Gazelle's self-scheduler. So day one, she's on vacation. The phone rings and I pick it up and uh, and, and the person says, hey, we just built a new house and the, the address not on Google and I tried using your self-scheduler, but the address wasn't there. So can I book an appointment? It took me 15 minutes to figure out where the darn house was, you know, turn past the hay bale, back past the big tree. And you know, so 15 minutes later, I get the appointment book. And I'm like, okay, great. Phone rings again. And they say, hey, um, I'm having computer problems today. Uh, I need to reschedule my appointment. And it's like, okay, great. You know, hang on, phone rings again. Hey, I had this special situation. I tried scheduling online and I'm going, is this going to go on all day? Well, actually it did. The only people who called me because we were using automation well were the people that had these like weird oddball out of the park situations. And I realized that day, wow, I'm not paying Sarah to sit on her uh, hands all day, like she's actually doing hard work for difficult customers who have unique situations. So um, another person who uses Gazelle told us that, you know, their office assistant, their first office assistant that they hired was Gazelle. And in a lot of ways, that's exactly what you're going to do, right? You've already signed up for Gazelle. If you have, that's your first office assistant. And so by automating first, you cut down on your need to hire somebody but eventually you're gonna grow even further. And that's probably where you find yourself today. And honestly, the last thing you have to do is you're gonna avoid common mistakes. And following the guide we provided, you can probably avoid 80% of the pitfalls you're gonna encounter. So good luck, we're gonna cheer you on. Others have successfully hired this position and you can too. Because armed with this information, you are not the rookie. You have all the tools you need to be a successful hire, to successfully hire your first office assistant. And we're going to be here to guide you along the way. All right. While we transition to Q&A and Luke sorts through the questions, uh, I want to give you a list of upcoming webinars that are coming soon. Uh, we're going to be covering every topic you can imagine related to building and running a piano service business. So if there's any webinars that you would like to have watched but you missed, you can always go back over there to growwithgazelle.com. Uh, School of Business, and you can actually watch past webinars you might have missed. And the team at Gazelle is excited to help you find the tools you need to save your time and wow your customers so that you can focus on growing your business and doing what you enjoy most. Real quick, before Luke jumps in with the questions, I just realized we didn't put the date of the next one. The next one's hiring your first technician. And so that is March 19th, and you can register with gazelle.com forward slash school where you can watch the past webinars and register for this one. All right, thank you guys. Um, we do have a, a few questions here. And uh, as we're going along, everybody, please feel free to ask more questions. You can use the chat or the Q&A button there on your screen. Um, and we'll, uh, we'll add those questions to our list. Um, but let me get started with the ones that we do have. Um, so the first one here, um, I have someone right now who has been with me for about six months, but I'm realizing that I haven't been very clear in my expectations. Um, how, would you, uh, how would you recommend talking to them about this? Yeah, I, I would first say um, it's never too late to get clear in your expectations. 
So one of the first things you need to do is be humble, right? And you're going to step forward. And you're going to say to your employee, you know what? I just realized that I wasn't entirely clear about what my expectations were in this position. I've taken the time to take your job description. I've updated it. And I'd like to go over that with you. And then you're going to take the time to go through it. And you're going to follow the steps that we've laid out by doing both a re explaining exactly what the job is and then saying, and we're going to do a check-in in about one month to see how this is working. I want to make sure that this position is still working for you um, and that my expectations are clear and my expectations are being met. It's never, again, and never too late to take that step back and say, I need to be even more clear today. And also consider that this isn't a crisis. Mm -hmm. um, you probably have a decent person. Yeah. And so you don't need to do this tomorrow. Probably don't even need to do it next week. Might not even need to do it the following week. Take the time necessary to go ahead and go through the checklist and do it. Build it like you were building that position from scratch. Mm -hmm. Because one of the things that you could do is if two weeks from now you go off half cocked, uh, you could basically blow up their job description a little and say, I'm going to check in in a month. And then in a month you go, oh, there were three other things I forgot about. And you blow it up even more. And then three months from now, same thing happens. That's not going to be very good for your relationship. So, you know, consider that you might not need to do this for a month or two and go ahead and build the position out the right way and be really confident that when you go to them, um, you know, be aware that you're renegotiating their job. And so they might need to renegotiate as well and say, actually, um, I can't do that job or uh, I thought I was only being hired to do these two things over here. And now that I see I'm doing 20 uh, I either need to be paid for more hours or I need to be paid more per hour. So be aware of that as well and, and come prepared because if you look at it and you go, oh, I also realized I was underpaying you by $4 an hour, right? And you already raised prices and took care of some things. Then you could three months from now go to them and be like, I realized I didn't plan your position well. I've taken some time to think it through. I've realized I was probably underpaying you by $4 an hour. So I want to pay you an extra $4 an hour to do this long list. They're going to smile. That's a whole different situation you just set up. Solid. Okay, thank you. Um, next one here. Uh, after watching this, um, I don't know that I'm quite ready to hire a part-time person, but I do need, uh, definitely need um, office help. Have you ever looked into a generic call answering service? I have. Um, a lot of these services, um, I came really close to using one one day too. Um, a lot of these services have, the, the selling point is they say a real person will pick up the fall, call 24 seven or in between the hours of 6 a.m. and 11 p.m., right? So the benefit is you get a real person picking up a phone call. Uh, the downside is that person has almost no authority to do anything except take a message and tell them you're gonna call them back. And a lot of them have calendars in their system where if you're using their calendar, uh, then they can actually book an appointment right then and there. The problem is they're not gonna factor drive time and they're not gonna take the time to factor drive time. So Gazelle does that automatically you know, I, we run Gazelle and I call them. I was like, hey, what kind of APIs do you need to hook into this thing over here to make this work over here? Because I want your people to actually book appointments using our system. And, you know, a number of companies got back to me and their you know, head of their technical department finally got back to me and said, sorry, we really can't do that. We're not set up for that. And I just said, okay, thank you. Uh, you answered my question. So just know what you're paying for. And in some situations, this is actually a plus it might be better than what you have now, but not as good as you want it to be. And so if it's a temporary fix that solves a temporary problem, then great. I, I'd also just add one more thing to that, Tim, is um, think about the clients who are calling after hours, right? So if you've set up a time slot where you're clear about your hours, about when you might answer the phone, so you have a clear voicemail that says, hey, you know what, thanks for calling. Uh, if you'd like to book, please use my online booking system. Um, I'll be able to call you back or I'll talk to you from this time to this time. Then one of the things that's clear is that 
Some people call after hours because they don't want to get a live person. They're calling because they want to leave a message. Um, so just consider the fact that, again, working with an online calling group like that where they, they answer the call from 6 p.m. till you know, 11 p.m. at night till 6 in the morning sometimes isn't the best choice because that's not prob possible what your client is actually looking to get. Okay, thanks guys. Uh, we've got another question here. Um, please tell us more about training. How do you help them to be authoritative and knowledgeable with regard to pianos? Yeah, um, it is not as complex as you think. Uh, this is probably something right now where, you know, this, you understand pianos at a level 10. They understand pianos at a level zero. And maybe if they're family, they understand it at a one or a two. We have this big gap. Um, clients who call and get you expect you to have a level 10 knowledge. Clients who call and get your office assistant expect them to have a level three knowledge or a level four knowledge, right? I trained them the same way I used automation. Right. I used automation to take care of the 80% of scenarios that didn't need a live human. And I used humans to take care of the 20% of scenarios or 10% of scenarios that needed a human. And when they get the human, she's going or he is going to take care of, you know, 70, 80% of the scenarios where they can answer a basic question. Um, obviously, I did give them some training about here's what a piano is. Here's how often it needs to be tuned. Um, I found some YouTube videos uh, for one of the people I hired and I just, you know, that gave overviews of pianos and I just said, hey, watch these five videos. I gave them a working knowledge, a working knowledge of pianos and what they need is far less important than working knowledge of people and what they need. I hired people because I needed them to care about the people on the other end of the line because these were difficult customers typically calling in with special situations. And when you use automation well, that's what ends up happening. So um, give them a working knowledge. If you can't do that training in two and a half hours, you're making it too complex. I'm a big fan of learning from other fields, right? So looking at other areas and saying, well, what are they doing over there? And when I call my dentist and I get my, my dentist's office assistant, I don't expect my dentist's office assistant to tell me details about teeth, right? How often should I get it cleaned? Okay, great. So Tim, I think, I think you've totally nailed it. And it really is about understanding the role that you're hiring that person for and the problem they're trying to solve. So be clear, yes, give them the training for that FAQ of those things you know they're gonna get, but the mechanic's office assistant at the car shop is not gonna fix the car the way that the mechanic is. You're the tech, they're the assistant. I think it's great, Tim. Okay, next question. Um, how, much, uh, how much could I expect to pay for this position? Uh, it doesn't say where they're located, but um, I guess probably just uh, assume US dollars here, um, but how much would you expect to pay for this position? Yeah, um, if I could rephrase that question, I would rephrase it, and how often do you want it to turn over? Answer that question first, um, because if you want it to turn over every 12 months, in the US presently, you know, pay, pay 10 bucks an hour. Uh, if you want it to turn over every nine months or eight months, pay minimum wage. If you want it to turn over every, you know, um, and minimum wage might actually turn over every three months on you if you're paying minimum wage because they can go get that wage anywhere. If there's anything they don't like about that job, they're gone, <laughs> right? And so uh, the further you get away from minimum wage, the longer and longer and longer they're going to stick. Um, I did a bunch of research when I was trying, back when I realized I was doing interviews and I was saying I was paying X and people started getting back to me saying I liked the job but not the pay. I took another job over here for $2 more an hour. I started getting the message pretty quick. I needed to really up my game a little bit. So um, I would answer that question first and it's a range of you know, 12 bucks an hour, 25,000 a year might turn over every 12 to 24 months. 
uh, if you're paying more than $27 an hour, you're getting into uh, upper level office assistance in a big corporation. So if you look at uh, CEOs, like the office assistant to the CEO will sometimes make eighty-five dollars to $110,000 a year. Um, but they have a very stressful job. The office assistant to the executive vice presidents will probably make between fifty dollars and $75,000 a year. And the office assistants, as you go down the chain, will eventually be making 12 bucks an hour. And so you just kind of have to look at the job description and think, okay, well, how qualified do I want the person? how long do I want them to stay? And it's gonna be somewhere in there. Um, and you do, you need to do some research in your area or in the city that they live in if you're hiring them across country. Uh, George, you've hired a lot of people. How would you handle that? Well, I, th I think you, you nailed it right there at the end there, Tim. Um, one of the things we talked about earlier is this idea that you talk to other people, other freelancers who have hired office assistants in your area. Um, and it doesn't, again, doesn't have to be in your field. It doesn't have to be other piano texts, but talk to, you know, maybe it's a one, one shop dentist shop. You know, it's, it's just the dentist and the office assistant. Um, find other places that have this kind of position and just start asking around. Um, there are lots of ways to network with other business owners in your community. And, and that's the kind of place where you can get those conversations going. We have the same problem uh, with a couple of different places that we've worked at, I've worked at, that we've had to really look around at what's the going rate for this position or similar positions at other locations. Um, and then ask ourselves, and do we want to be in the same pool as those companies or do we want to be reaching slightly higher? Well, let's, let's put that $2 higher. Or are we okay with not having that level, maybe actually going a, a dollar less? Um, again, and again, that, that Whopper test is huge. You can learn real fast what really is considered the lowest wage to pay based on what people are getting paid at the local Aldi to check out people and you know what, what's going on at, at McDonald's to flip burgers. All right, guys, we've got uh, two more questions. Um, and I want to um, uh, let everyone know too, uh, feel free to submit some more questions. But uh, so far, we've got two more here. Um, uh, lately, I've found myself working every evening, returning phone calls and email. Um, how long should I let this go on before I really need to hire someone? Well, good question. Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> Radius <laughs> silence on wheels are turning on both of us. George, do you want to take it? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so the first thing I would say is how long should I continue? How long can you, right, is, is the first question I would ask. And then again, go back to our very first question we asked, what is the problem you're trying to solve? So I would do that 10 days where you're going to look through all those tasks you're doing. And you might find, hey, wait a minute, I'm actually spending a lot of my evenings making these phone calls, but maybe it's because there's something else going on during your day. If you have been able to go through our checklist and ticked off the, yes, I have the money to pay for this. Yes, I have a need and there's a problem I'm trying to solve with this position and you've gone through the rest of our checklist items, which I'm not going to go through right now, then you've, yes, you're ready. And it's time to really to, to, to pull that trigger and get ready to go. And if you're not, then honestly, if you're already at the point where you're like, yes, I have a need. Okay. What's the rest of that checklist you can work through and you could be hiring in 12 weeks. Yeah. Something I would do is if I woke up in your shoes, uh, what I heard in the question was, this week was kind of an anomaly. It was the first time that I had to spend every night, you know, doing things. And I kind of didn't like that, especially if this is going to continue. And so I'm kind of looking for a reason not to hire. Um, and so usually freelancers, it, this title of this webinar is hiring your first office assistant. Usually freelancers who are used to working on their own are somewhat disorganized. And it's not uncommon to have that be the situation. So if you were working every night this week because you were disorganized, as you're going through that checklist, the reason we gave you the checklist is because it forces you to look in the mirror and say, oh, I actually see that as the problem isn't that I need somebody. The problem is that I'm disorganized. So then you get organized. And then you go through that 10 day check again and you see, okay, great. Well, now I'm not as stressed and I only worked one night a week. Um, or maybe you fit everything in normal business hours. But there's a high likelihood that you've let this go on too long. 
And this was just a straw that broke the camel's back because it wasn't that you were answering one or two calls every night. It's that you were calling people at 8.30 and 9 o'clock. And I can't tell you how many technicians I've talked to who do that or did that years ago before all, all the automation online started coming available. Um, so anyway, uh, what problem are you trying to solve? That's the most important thing that you can identify, especially if you're a little bit disorganized right now. And last question we have here, and then uh, I think we'll wrap it up. Um, earlier, you suggested that we should raise rates before hiring someone. Why should I do this now instead of after I hire someone? Why raise rates before I hire someone? The worst thing you could do is hire someone and then realize that it's not financially sustainable and have to fire them. Because now what you've done is you've wasted money. You were already on the edge of financial sustainability and now you've thrown money down the tube, right? So part of the reason why you're going to raise rates now is you're going to, you're going to make sure that that is sustainable for yourself and your company. And then you're going to start building that buffer of saving up your three months worth of expenses so that you can be more aware of, of where your revenue is and where your expenses are going out so that when you hire your company is, is ready for success. Yeah. Um, one of the things too, that we didn't talk about in this webinar that we talked a lot about in the pricing webinar, how to price your services um, as your pricing structure changes, it actually affects a couple of other things in your company. Um, usually your company grows. Usually you do a much better job because you're being more intentional, right? There's a lot of positives here to raising rates. It's not this um, accident that you raise rates and it worked. Um, but one of the things that happens is you start, depending on where the pricing uh, map, heat map is in your area, whether you're at the top, at the bottom, in the middle, and you're raising prices to go from the middle to the top or from the middle to the second in the area, depending on where you're at on that spectrum, sometimes you have to adjust your marketing to meet your new price because you hadn't been planning on hiring this person. That overhead didn't need to be there. So you were able to charge a lower rate that attracted a different kind of customer. But now you realize I have to raise rates 25 bucks and oh, I was the number two in the area. Now I'm the number one. So we want you to raise rates now and go watch that webinar if you want a lot more details on how to do that. But um, because it's going to give you a couple of months to both critically think through raising rates. So earlier we said that this webinar had about a three month um, application period. But if your first step is raising rates, well, first you need to actually, if you're substantially doing that, go, go watch that and do that. So maybe it's gonna be four or five months before you hire someone because you need to do a little bit of work on the pricing front. But what we don't want to have happen is for you to be really comfortable at X rate hire somebody, teach them how to do the role, and then immediately or two months later raise rates and then nothing that you did before worked because your clients are of a different caliber now, right? That's another way that you get into hot water if you don't do it beforehand. And so in addition to doing it beforehand, you raise rates, your clients pay for that emergency fund. And so you basically pay that salary even though you don't have somebody into the savings account. So now you get to hire somebody without a lot of stress and you're much better as a coach and a business owner and a boss uh, when you're in that situation. All right, thank you guys for answering the questions. Thank you for taking time to um, share all this information with us. Um, tomorrow, I'm going to email out a link to this video if you wanna watch it again later um, or send it to anybody. Um, it will also include the, the slide deck uh, as well and also the checklist um, that, uh, that they mentioned. Uh, I'll be sending that out at some point tomorrow. Um, but thank you all for joining us and hope you have a good evening. Good night.